Alright. Welcome back, honors. So, we left off in class. I know it's the weekend, so I'll try not to uh, get hung up on all like the pleasantry kind of stuff, right? But we left off in class talking about the, uh, oh, the expansion of Philip II, right, of Macedonia. Father of Alexander the Great. Uh, sorry, this is my cactus, Bert, and I'm just trying to make sure he's growing in the right direction. Um, now, we started talking about Philip II, though, right? And the big thing about Philip II is he's actually going to, oh, come on, don't be sunburnt. Um, but he's actually going to start expanding following the Peloponnesian War, right? So we talked about how he got shot in the eye and uh, very, very devout in his faith, believed in a lot of different things like that, talked to the Oracle of Delphi, saw something he wasn't supposed to see, right? Missed that good story. Gianna, or no, Gianna, you were there. Uh, but if you missed that good story, Rocco, Hobbes, uh, Magrino, it was a good one, um, about what he saw. But anyway, Philip's going to seek to change Macedonia and to become the dominant Greek power following the Peloponnesian War. So he's going to set out, right, to actually take over the entirety of Greece from the north, right, from Macedonia. Now, he's going to do this by, first of all, organizing the Macedonians together and create, like, <clears throat> excuse me, conquer a bunch of smaller city-states one at a time following the Peloponnesian War. While he does this, he then conscripts new military, he begins to expand his military and make it much more dominant, and he does this by just adding to it. But his best attribute is he also was, like, perfected the Greek phalanx system, right? Was it used by the Spartans? Yes. Was it used by the Athenians? Yes. But what did anybody use it to the degree of which Philip II used it? No, all right? He also introduced new technological matters like longer spears, right? Uh, use, the use of cavalry behind them. It makes it much more multifaceted instead of just a primitive shield wall, okay? So very, very big professional using the phalanx. And also he did this by not entering into open field combat with a, like every single group that he actually came up against. He would use diplomacy to actually try and lure the neutral states of Greece that never even participated in the Peloponnesian War to align with him under his protection. And then also he would go after people like Sparta using things like threats, right? He would threaten them and be like, for example, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, he actually never took over Sparta, but he did threaten them like, if you get involved, we will destroy you, right? Actually, Sparta would be later on taken over by Thebes. And then actually, he actually went after Thebes and took over Thebes later on. So he actually inherited Spartans, Sparta's holdings following that. Now, Bribes he's going to use to take over larger city-states, and he's also going to create alliance systems, right? But he starts all the way up here in the north and just begins to just keep expanding and expanding, taking over northern Greek city-states and also places like Thebes and Athens, which is right down here. And then he just keeps on pushing forward. Now, Philip's also, though, going to notice something along the way. By his side, while he's leading over all of these people, his 14-year-old son is actually with him, right? And he's going to hire, he sees all of this potential in him, right? These fantastic stories of Alexander begin whilst his dad is taking over all of Greece, right? So he's going to nurture these fantastic myths. Like, for example, according to legend, Philip II was trying to tame a horse for his own use that no one could tame. And then his son, Alexander, just walked up to the horse grabbed it by the reins, yanked it down, and tamed it himself, right? Just walked up to us, was like, shh, right? And just tamed this horse. And according to legend, he looked upon that his son and was like, just thinking to himself, you will literally control the entire, entire known world one day. Why will my... Oh, man, sorry. My best friend at home just like repeated texting me the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Uh... That's awful. Um, so one of our favorite spots to go is closing at home. So anyway, now when Alexander is 18, though, he actually, as he's like taking over uh, the entirety of Greece with his father, right, turns 18 underneath him. And then he helps his dad actually defeat the leftover Delian League, Thebes, and Athens actually surrenders completely out of fear. Right? So, remember, Philip's using diplomacy, threats, bribes, also just kind of fear-mongering as well. Right? So, and this right here, very, very famous bust of Alexander with one of his very famous looks. I think Alexander probably invented, like, the white boy hair flip, you know, the one that I'm talking about where guys just go, ugh, you know, just, like, fling it out of their hair. Because Alexander was very well known for his mane of hair, but also the fact that it was messy and tousled and just not very, like, tameable, right? Like his spirit. Oh, Alexander. Apparently he smelled great when he sweat, too. Now, Philip wanted to conquer Persia, 
and he actually sought to do that next. However, unfortunately, he's not going to get to do that with his son Alexander by his side and also his tutor Aristotle following along with them because Philip's going to be assassinated at his daughter's wedding by one of his own bodyguards, right? Now, some of you are like, Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry, why would one of his own bodyguards assassinate him? That's a story I don't want to tell on the internet, all right? So if you remind me on Monday, I'll tell you as to why Philip was stabbed by one of his own bodyguards, as according to the account of Aristotle. Now, someone like Dean or Sam is probably going to be tempted to go and look this up on his own. Don't do it, Michael. All right, so that's right. I called all three of y'all out. Don't do it. Let me tell you that story. It's a good one, okay? So um, now, he's going to be stabbed to death by one of his daughters, though. And also, here's the thing about it. Philip kind of got around a little bit. He had seven different wives, right? The chief wife that actually apparently cheated on him in that story where he saw some stuff we want, he wasn't supposed to see, according to like legend and according to the accounts that we have, Olympias outmaneuvered those other wives, which was the wife that was cheating on him, right? Then outmaneuvered them and placed her son Alexander on the throne, right? So Alexander then goes off of the court of his father and decides, if I'm going to do anything in this life, I have to do what I have to do, and I'm going to take over the entire known world. And he's going to hold on to all of Greece, and he's going to spend the next two years building up his military. He's going to create an army large enough with enough ships to cross the Aegean, and he's going to attempt to conquer the Persian Empire. That stretches 2,000 miles all the way from Egypt all the way over to India, right? The, Ach the Ach Achaeanid? Ach Achaeanid? It's the former leftovers of Cyrus's empire, and it starts with an A. It's like Achaenid or Achaenid. I'll look it up in a minute. Now, anyway, so the Aegean Sea, though, he's going to cross that and begin his trek forward, right? Now, there's a guy that he absolutely hates when he's in pursuit of all these people. It's one of the Dariuses of Persia. Not Darius the first, but I believe it's Darius the second, right? So he's obsessed with trying to kill this guy, right? He's like, I'm going to take over all of Persia by destroying their leader in Persepolis, and I myself am going to strike Darius down and take over the Persian Empire like my father sought to do, right? So he has to start out in Egypt, though. He actually crosses over and he goes into Egypt. But the thing about it is he's actually so Persia was very, very weak at the time, right? So he actually came into a very, very good situation. He's going to reinforce his cavalry. He's going to get those really long 12-foot spears that nobody actually even uses. And he's going to battle his way through the entire Persian Empire, right? There's all these stories, too, about the amazing things he did while he was on trek. One of the stories goes that apparently he was in the desert and all of his, his entire military was just like, oh, like in the bac Bacteria Desert or Bacterion Desert, it starts with a B. And he is actually trudging through with his entire military. And they're all sitting there like, we ran out of water. I guess we'll just drink wine. Well, if you don't know this, like wine actually makes you more dehydrated. So, and then they're like, oh God, we don't have any wine. Let's just drink this olive oil. And then also that was weighing on their stomachs and they were all sitting there almost about to starve and they're just crawling forward. And then they look over at Alexander and he doesn't have any water left either. So they actually collect all the water that they have left and they're like, they hand him this cup of water, and they're like, sir, sir, drink this water. And he was like, if I don't drink, you don't drink. And gives it back to them and says, give it to your sons. And they're like, oh, my God, I die for you. And then they just go and take over all of Egypt, right? It's absolutely insane. There's another thing that says, like, oh, these vultures start flying out in front of them. And then it began to rain following those, like, the moments where he actually saved his men. And then they were refreshed, and they took over all of Egypt and then conquested Perth. Like, all these amazing stories, right? These fantastically amazing stories about the Alexander the Great taking over the Persian Empire, but in the long run, historically speaking, it was actually just very weak from very weak rulers, right? So Alexander apparently never once lost a battle. He went like 300 and 0, over 300 different engagements and never once lost. He even never lost when he came up against war elephants in India, right? So, which... It's just very amazing when you think about it, because every time an Eastern civilization has ever tried to come up on a Western one with elephants, they've always lost. I wonder sometimes if the elephants were even there, or maybe they were just made up, right? So anyway, but continuing forward, I don't myself would never want to go up against an elephant. Now, before setting out again, though, unfortunately, Alexander is going to die before he even sees 40, all right? So he was in his 30s, and he's, before setting out again, he apparently, according to one of the Greek historians, died from a sudden fever, right? That story is even going to be changed later on because people are like, oh, wait a minute, the manliest man in all of history cannot die from a simple fever. He has to die from something impressive like alcohol poisoning, syphilis, or other poisoning, right? So like, oh, dastardly. Like, so the thing about it, 
where I'm getting with all of this is, first of all, according to the legend, is that Alexander was laying in his bed and somebody was like, Sir, sir, who do we leave the empire to? And he was like, leave it to the best. And then they gave it to his three most trusted generals, right? And it turned into a, the Hellenistic kingdoms, right? They actually fragmented themselves. So the Hellenistic Empire wasn't even a thing while he was alive, right? So actually that whole period started following his death. And over the next 300 years, the empire began to slowly fall apart because men began battling for control over it, right? Because they never actually stayed unified. They also were very, very poor at building things up. They really liked to tear things down, right? And fun fact too, n notice, remember, like all of these, where I was getting with all those stories, there are no historical accounts of Alexander the Great whilst he was alive. They were all written following his death. So that actually tells us a lot about little things about him is that probably a lot of these things were exaggerated, right? The, the image of Alexander the Great was probably beefed up quite a bit, right? So much so that people be in, like throughout history, like Pompey and Napoleon are actually going to become obsessed with his image and try to emulate him. Right, so they uh, when we get to Pompey, don't let me forget. It's the thing about his hair, like he was just trying to like imagine being like him. And apparently, Napoleon invaded Egypt just because Alexander did the same. Right, so like the thing about it is, Alexander may have not done as much as we believe that he had. He may have just had better technology and a larger military and gone after a place that was just very weak, for all we know. But he became known as Alexander the Great, right? One of the big stories about him, remember when I was saying he was chasing Darius across Persia, trying to assassinate him and kill him himself by his own hand. Well, one of his generals actually got to him first and killed Darius before Alexander could. So then Alexander spent weeks then chasing after that general and then had him killed by his own hand he was like i gotta kill at least the guy that killed him so like alexander's imagery might not have been all it was chalked up to be but the empire he left behind was a very amazing thing even though he was much better at destroying places and then not building them up as much now he actually did usher in this thing though called the hellenistic eighth right which was a blend of greek Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Indian cultures resulted in what we know is that somebody better be like, the alarm better be going off, and Leah and Taylor and, uh, you know, like, Danahi and Rivera better just be going, cultural diffusion! Yes, cultural diffused, like, properties make everything better, right? doesn't matter what you say about Alexander the Great. The fact that he united a region amongst several different cultures and then unified them blends their positive attributes to one another. So a great era was like coming off of his death, right? So he actually made a unified uh, language. Greek became the language of the Hellenistic Empire, leading to some of the most enlightening intelligent things, intelligence like beliefs that ever happened. Alexandria, Egypt had the largest and best library that the world had ever seen, right? So uh, amazing, amazing things happened. One of the coolest things you can see actually is the blending of the different um, cultures is that Alexandria actually became the capital of their entire empire. Alexandria, Egypt, not in Greece, not in Macedonia. He moved it to a central location to make actually like ruling over the empire a little bit easier, even though ironically enough, after his death, when it became like three separate kingdoms, it wasn't even necessarily ruled from that one location. But it was the capital of this new empire. Boasted everything from Greek marble all the way to Arabic spices. It was home to over a million people. And also one of the craziest things that was left behind by it, you can see the blending of them, is look at the skin tone of the sarcophagi or these, these sarcophagi left behind in Alexandria, Egypt. You'll notice looking at them, you're like, wait a minute, this guy right here, his, he's too fair of skin to be considered an Egyptian. It's because he's Greek, right? Like, so, like, one of the amazing things is, like, the mummification practices began to transfer over to the Greeks, right? Like, that is a Greek man that had been mummified under Egyptian principles. So, like, these amazing different cultural things began to just blend together and merge, and it resulted in phenomenal intelligence. And also, like, women began to exalt their status. The last ruler of the Hellenistic Egyptian Empire, the last pharaoh, was a woman, Cleopatra VII, which I think she should be called the Great, even though she bet on the wrong horse, Mark Antony. Ugh. Like, happens to the best of us. But also, new ideas are going to lurch forward. Ptolemy was actually a scientist underneath this entire... That's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. Ptolemy was a scientist underneath this entire empire. And he began to try and map the universe with different models, including the heliocentric universe, where the sun is at the center, and the geocentric universe, which he believed in, which was actually the Earth was at the center of the universe. Advances in medicine began to leap forward with Hippocrates creating the Hippocratic Oath. And people began to like actually practice the first success surgeries art is going to lurch forward as well when like 
the like sculptures and uh, the max like maximi max maximizing the potential of the marble into being able to be human proportion. That's the Venus de Milo, right? It's one of the best known examples of Hellenistic art that has survived. Her arms were actually broken off like throughout, but it's one of the best surviving pieces that we have. And it's proportional and it's amazing. And then Archimedes was an inventor from this period. As you can tell, the Hellenistic period is very, very important because it just, uh, like it just like it completely lurched intelligence forward, right? Regardless of the fact that Alexander did destroy a lot of things without building a lot of places back up again and named basically every other city after himself. Uh, there was Alexandria in Kazakhstan. There's an Alexandria in Afghanistan. There's an Alexandria in, uh, in like the for in like northern India. There's an Alexandria in, in Iran now. Like it's like, huh? But the thing about it is, is they did they did lurch us forward, right? They uh, like created more literature, more music, more art, more monetary systems, more amazing, amazing things that will never actually, like, the world would not be the same without them, right? So, and, he, like, Archimedes is, like, the last guy I like to talk about. He was actually the inventor from the Hellenistic period. Eureka, the Eureka man himself, right? He actually invented the Archimedes screw, which is a very cool principle. It's one of the very first wells for transferring an item from a lower level up to a higher level by just turning a screw. So he actually came up with theories on density. That's his Eureka moment when he actually got down in his bathtub, apparently, and the water displaced and actually came up, and he realized that density properties for, like, water displacing one another being made out of different molecular materials and things like that and he like jumped up out of uh, like his bathtub and ran, ran screaming through the streets naked eureka 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 i've got it in alexandria egypt huh. he also apparently invented this like heat ray which uh they found out on mythbusters never actually was real um so but it's a concaved mirror for focusing light to a focal point to actually try and like roast ships in harbors outside when they were trying to attack uh, Alexandria. Um, and then also he came up with some math properties. He also invented a lot of simple machines. He actually apparently invented the very first multi-craned, uh, the very first multi-pulleyed crane system where apparently he walked up onto the shores and somebody was like, he bet someone, he was like, I bet you I can lift that boat out of the water with just two hands. And they were like, no, you can't. And he attached it to this crane and he just went, how you like me now? I'm like, so, ha, ah, the Hellenistic period is an amazing, amazing thing. Now, it's only going to last for so long because right now, in the 300s BC, when the Hellenistic Greeks are hitting to their heights, there's over about a couple thousand miles to the west, in this little place called Italy, there are these people called the Romans that are bubbling up, right? So, and that's the people we'll get into next. So with this information, you'll be able to finish up your study guide. Your next test is going to be on next Tuesday, or this coming Tuesday, right? We're going to have a game day on Monday, and then we're going to uh, get into our study guide stuff, or not our study guide stuff, Map Quiz Wednesday. So we got game day Monday, Tuesday's test day, Map Quiz Wednesday. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Go Birds. We need it, right? So let's get after it, and very impressed with you guys so far. You are literally on the heels of the CP kids faster than any honors class I've ever had. So just keep working hard, keep doing your thing, and I'll see you guys on Monday. So have a great weekend. Go birds, baby.